So is everybody ready for this? We got something pretty exciting coming up. Um, so if you want to build a, a world-class company, you've got to have world-class performers. So we thought hard about this, and we thought, look, we have a, a local guy here who is a world-class performer in every respect. So I've known Simon now for three or four years. Um, he's uh, brilliant. Uh, these are my words, how I describe him. He's impatient. He's somebody who's never satisfied. He sort of sees the gaps in the world. Um, he gets stuff done. He sort of solves the unsolvable. And if you didn't know he was a world-class musician, you'd think that describes an entrepreneur. So he does have another part to his CV that sort of departs from the rest of us, and that is this. He was a child prodigy. He played Mozart concerto at the Sydney Opera House at age nine. Uh, he performed with the Adelaide Orchestra at 13, um, concert pianist at 18. He has played for the Dalai Lama, Pavarotti, the US president. Uh, he's been described as an exhilarating and breathless performer, uh, the greatest Gershwin exponent ever seen, exceptional talent, the rarest of gems, uh, and my favorite is smoldering and furious. Um, don't play uh, trivia with him if you're talking about horror, horror movies because he is a horror movie fanatic. Uh, and I could go on and on, but let's see for ourselves. Uh, my pleasure to introduce you to Simon Tedeschi.
So uh, I, I think you'll agree uh, we have a performer. Um, so one of the things, uh, as I said in the introduction, is that uh, you know all all uh, companies, if they're going to be successful, have to have somebody who's very very creative and and is a top class performer. And, and Simon uh, exhibits that in spades. Um, so what we thought we would do is we'd spend a few minutes. Uh, speaking with Simon about creativity, about how he approaches things, bring some of that out, and then we're going to uh, put him on the spot and see if we can do something with him kind of interesting. So I have a couple of questions. Um, so if we could just go to the next slide, please. Um, somebody can switch. Okay, so this is one of the things, this is one of the quotes that I took from, from one of his interviews, and, it, and if we can read this, it says, one of the things that, that binds artists together is that they're constantly looking forward, eternally unsatisfied by the chasm that exists, between what they can and should do, and they are eternally unhappy with the status quo. And I think this is, if we change one word in here, and can we go to the next slide? Um, if we change one word from artists to entrepreneurs, it's exactly the same thing that uh, entrepreneurs do. And that is, they are sort of eternally unsatisfied with the way the world works, and all great businesses start with, with wanting to change something. So what, what, what did you mean by that? Is, what was your sort of thought process in, in that? Well. Uh... The, an artist is eternally dissatisfied, and in many ways that is because the art, the art is always greater than us as performers. And uh, it, it uh, certainly lends a, a humility uh, to the performer, because no matter how well we do and how well we play, um, it's never good enough. And uh, I mean, that can certainly go too far. <laughs> but um, it's no. also... <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I'm living proof. But at the same time, it's a, it's a marvellous reminder and keeps you very, very grounded, especially in the... I mean, everybody here has uh, extraordinary skills. Um, there's something, of course, performing that there's a lot of grandiosity in performing. Um, and it's very, very important to remember that the music is always greater, and thus that really tends to level one out. So, so uh, let me ask you a question. So you just you went from The Simpsons to Rhapsody in Blue, uh, which is an interesting transition. But how many times have you actually performed Rhapsody in Blue live? Oh, I've performed Rhapsody in Blue. In fact, I throw down the gauntlet to any musician in the world to have played this more than I have. Um, so I, this is not an accident. I mean, <laughs> the way you're able to do this is, is not an accident. Certainly not, but the Rhapsody in Blue is, because I mean, there are a lot of Americans here, I'm guessing, and Rhapsody in Blue is really the ultimate American piece. It's very free and it's, it's in its construction. And it also used to be the, uh, the theme song for United Airlines. Though. Exactly, <laughs> much to my sufferance. <laughs> um, but uh, Rhapsody in Blue is, uh, I mean, I'm able, especially with that piece, to really uh, extemporize it's Rhapsody in Blue consists of three large solo flourishes with orchestra, and that gives me an enormous capacity to mix and match, not unlike cooking a favourite recipe, but in a slightly different way. For instance, I only had 10 minutes there, strict instructions from Bill, but it goes for 18 minutes. What am I to do? And these are the things I have to think about while playing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in, you know, I know that uh, one of the things for you is, and one of the things for all people who are building great companies and great great product company, companies is they have to be different. They have to present something different. And I know that you just um, finished, I think, uh, pictures in a, at an exhibition by Mussorgsky. And that's, and that's, been, that's been played a lot. So how do you approach, how do you, how do you differentiate yourself from the rest of the people out there who are playing this? How do you present, how do you think about differentiating what you do versus what everybody else out there does? Well, what you just said applies also to Rhapsody in Blue. And the thing that really hits home for me is authenticity. Um, very much often in, uh, not just classical music, but in a lot of music, there's this idea of uh, the identity sort of being superimposed onto the performer, kind of, you know, like a, you know, what's the, the trend or what's the angle we're going for? But I find very much it, that uh, if one is authentic, um, then one has a natural conviction that people, whether laymen or experienced cognoscenti, can just intuitively understand. And uh, that, that's really what I try to keep very close to my heart. Yeah, and I, I think that's really important because, you know, oftentimes we see, um, uh, we, we, we have at Blackbird something we call the authentic connection, which means that there has to be a connection between the entrepreneur and what he or she is doing. And if it's not there, the, the uh, product or the performance is not nearly as good. Mm. Um, so, and it certainly is evident in your case. Well, there has to be the um, authenticity for the performer, but to add um, 
there is the audience, and of course the audience must be pleased. It's a form of entertainment. But there's also, and many would hold this as the, the highest point, the apex of the triangle, which is the composer's intentions. And it's the age-old question. How do I honor the composer's intentions, um, which themselves are nuanced? Nothing is black and white in music. And I, don't, I dare say nothing is black and white in life at all, or business. And um, how do I do that while remaining authentic? And uh, this is yep. the question. Yeah. So, so in, a, in, a, in your case, your customers are the people who are sitting in the audience. And in a, in a um, software business, for instance, it's the customers who are buying the product. So each is looking for a certain thing, and that is they have to love the product or love the performance. And in your case, the performance really is the product that you sell. Absolutely. Selling. And also, in a sense, it's a product for me as well, because why do I play so much Gershwin? I just feel intuitively Gershwin is close to my personality. There's a certain mercurial aspect, and there's also a, a white-hot sort of energy. I would choose that in terms of my own playing rather than Chopin or Bach, um, not because I, I would play it terribly, but because I feel that I would give a more convincing interpretation. So I, I play to my strengths, um, certainly. But there's also something to be said, sometimes going completely the opposite way and, and playing a Schubert sonata, which is closer to meditation than what I've just done. Yeah, but you, you know, so, so that's sort of interesting because you grew up playing classical music, so you're a classical musician, but you also play jazz, you play blues, you play, you play everything. So does, does your training as a classical musician bring, bring something different to, let's say, the typical jazz player when you play something in jazz? So, so does it, uh, I guess the question more as it pertains to the audience is, is an outsider's view of a problem, does that bring opportunities and does it bring uh, problems as well? It's, it's brought both. Um, as a classical um, musician, I certainly bring a particular sense of rhythmic drive and impetus to jazz, which is not what you would say pure jazz. Um, but similarly, it has, uh, it has um, given me an enormous, you know, widen my worldview musically. And uh, I mean, nothing <laughs> is black and white in music. You could say that uh, um, to be able to play jazz and to be able to play Gershwin and to be able to play Mozart and to be able to play Prokofiev, um, people love and need to find categorizations. Um, but being so restless as I am, I have uh, ab abandoned um, you know, specializing in one. Um, it's, it's actually proven to be very beneficial for me in a prosaic business sense, I suppose you could say. So does the restlessness and the never satisfied, does that make you a, a better musician, do you think? Absolutely. I mean, uh, um, when you look at uh, any artist and, you know, the, the business people that I've met, there's, there's never a resting on one's laurels, there's never a feeling of, oh, you know, I've done it now. If you've done that, if, you, if you're getting to that point, then you have just died as a musician. You know, I heard a phrase once that uh, a horse that doesn't run is a dead horse. Right. <laughs> and that, that just stuck in my mind. Yeah. I, I think that's true because if you're not if you're not constantly improving as a business or as an entrepreneur, then you, you've been, somebody's going to disrupt you. That's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, let's let's do something. But first, I want to hear just a couple of quick things. So how do you how do you create something out of nothing? I mean, because you you know your job, like an entrepreneur's job, is you've got to find a gap. You got to create something where nothing exists, and it's got to offer value to the audience or value to the to the pro, to the to the uh, customer that you're selling to. So how do you? What's sort of the general things you do? Well, I suppose as a performer, the composition has been written, but I would imagine that even for somebody who has seemingly created something out of nothing, nothing doesn't really exist because there's always a framework, there's always an infrastructure. I mean, there's always, you know, favorable options. If I had been born in, uh, in Nigeria, perhaps I would not be a classical pianist now. Um, there's all of these kind of aspects. Um, but I find, again, authenticity to be a wonderful way of approaching this and simply going back to what the composer has asked me to do um, as a performer. I find uh, research to be very important. Research, what did Mussorgsky do? Um, why was he a severe alcoholic? Um, Gershwin, <laughs> his time in Tin Pan Alley, but also uh, the fact that he was uh, the descendant of Russian Jews who ended up you know, in Ellis Island, whereas my family ended up in Circular Quay, but that's a different story. <laughs> what does that say about Gershwin? What pathos does that bring to his music? Um, why did Gershwin empathize so much with the music of African America and also Latin America? Um, what was it? Um, 
And how did this even fit in geopolitically? This was these the music that you just heard, not Simpsons, but Gershwin, is really uh, the. Um, I don't know the Simpsons. It's pretty pretty good. Across. <laughs> it's pretty good, but it's the the earliest murmurings of globalization, right? There you have yeah. five cultures, but I mean, you know, it's to be glib, but not entirely glib. The Simpsons follows on from yeah, that. I mean, sure. you've got you've got the the language of Leonard Bernstein in there. But definitely, the blues is implied there, but it's with a, a very very symphonic uh, classical attitude. So really, it does follow and everything is connected. So do you mind if we uh, put you on the spot for a minute? Go ahead. OK, so, uh, <clears throat> so let's see if we can uh, have you create something out of nothing. Is that all right? Absolutely. OK, so I need a, is a Mick Lebensis here somewhere? So, so Mick, can you go in that door over there and come around to the front of the stage? No, I think it's the next one up. Can somebody get Mick? He's gonna, can, and so we're going to play a little game. So if, if this is OK, we're going we're gonna to see if we can have Simon create something out of nothing so he doesn't know anything about this, he's not prepared for this. And we'll see if we can. Uh, You're not going to make me sing. No, no, no. We're not going to make you sing. <laughs> uh, but thanks. So, so Mick Levinskis. Hi, Mick. Uh, so, so what I have here is um, I've got, uh, I've got eight, uh, seven notes of the musical scale. So what, what I'm going to ask Mick to do, Mick, can you, if you can come over here, please. and. Uh, what I'd like you to do, no, no, you can't see them. Uh, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pick three of these notes, yeah. um, and we'll pick them in any order you want. Uh, they're sort of all mixed up, so just, okay. And one more. Okay, and if you'd give them to Simon, please. Mm -hmm. So Simon, what do we have? We have a B, an E, and a D. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is, uh, can you do a walking bass? Uh, Absolutely. Wa walking bass blues? Absolutely. Um, what I look at when I see these three notes is a D, an E, and a B. And I think, well, what are the keys of the blues? E in a blues it could be dumb, but it's pretty rotten. B, five sharps, it also sounds pretty rotten. But there's certainly, of all these three, thank goodness he chose one, um, D is, uh, it has the darkest quality. It has the meanest quality. So. A walking bass, I'm sure everyone knows what a walking bass is, but just in case, I'm going to start in D. So, stabbing right hand. And now I've got to start with Nick's melody D. Still don't know what I'm doing. language of the blues. So I'll go into G now. Do you want a bit of stride? Do a stride. Now stride is a completely different thing because it's that typical oompa oompa sound. So G, E and D, that's like the American HSC, isn't it? G, E, D. <laughs> so it's this sound. Let's uh, you pick any any of those notes, and let's let's do something in jazz. Play something jazzy. All righty. <laughs> okay. That's a really good description. A of something G jazzy. F D E. F is definitely the best. 
I haven't had an F yet. G is getting good, but F, compare the G blues sound to an F blues sound. Can you hear the difference? It's ineffable, but there is some kind of difference. <laughs> So many blues are written in F. And so I have here A and a G, which are all in the F blues scale, a D and an E, which is not, because that, that, that doesn't sound like the blues, but I've got to use it as a passing note somehow. So now Bill wants some jazz, and by that I'm guessing he wants some sort of bebop jazz, you know, like we hear on the sitcoms. So. E. All right. The simplest uh, blueses can be achieved with just two notes. Duke Ellington famously wrote C jam blues, which has two notes. So if I put in a two notes, anyone here could play this. The melody just simply goes like this. simple and yet it says so much, not even because of the notes used, but because of the space in between the notes, which is a whole different thing. So. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, so I, I think you can see that, uh, you know, if you have performers like Simon in your company, you're going to go a long ways and, uh, you know, he can, he can create... You haven't seen my credit rate. Yeah. <laughs> He could, he could create on the spot, uh, you know, he sees uh, problems and, and he can solve them immediately. Uh, and that's what you need as, a, as an entrepreneur when you're hiring a great team. So we got a minute 40 left, so I'll just hand it over to you and you can do anything you want for a minute 40. So All this right. is another thinking on the spot. All yours. This is how Rimsky-Korsakov would have written Flight of the Bumblebee had he been a boogie-woogie pianist. Thank you very much. And look at this, five seconds left.